Good morning. If I could have everyone's attention, I think we're going we're gonna to start a few minutes behind schedule. Thank you. So good morning. My name is Danielle Spiegelfeld. I'm the executive director of the Gorini Center in Environmental Energy and Land Use Law here at the law school. On behalf, on behalf of the Gorini Center, our affiliated faculty, Professor Katrina Wyman, uh, Professor Dick Stewart, who will be joining us shortly, and our co-host, the Ecologic Institute, with a particular shout out to Max Grunig. I wanted to welcome you to this event on the German energy transition and its implications for New York State. We're really delighted to be able to put on this event and are very much indebted to the support of the German Embassy, thank you very much, and the Transatlantic Books, Climate. All right, so, and the Transatlantic Climate Bridge for making the event possible. The mission of the Guarini Center is to advance market-oriented energy and environmental policies for a sufficient, uh, sorry, an efficient and sustainable economy. And to that end, we've been following very keenly the energy transition underway in Germany to move away from fossil and nuclear energy. The energy transition, as en has been noted by New York's energy czar Richard Kaufman, to be, and I'll quote, a model to show that quite a lot of renewable energy can be brought online in a very short period of time. I think in 2014, Germany received approximately 30% of its electricity from renewable energy resources, which is quite extraordinary. Um, and the, the ramp up has, has been really at a breakneck speed. But the energy transition, or Energiewende, as I believe it's known in, in German, if you'll forgive my pronunciation, has also attracted its fair share of criticism. Critics tend to point to the allegedly soaring uh, retail electricity rates and declining utility market share as evidence that the energy venda has failed, or at least should be a cautionary note for energy reform advocates here who would like to hasten the transition to a more distributed renewable energy future. So our task today is to begin to sort through these competing narratives, and we're very fortunate to have an incredibly talented and knowledgeable group of experts to help us with that task. Um, I will just provide very brief introductions, but you have more elaborate bios in the printed materials of the speakers. First, we're, we're joined by Georg Mao, who's the first Secretary for Climate and Energy Issues at the German Embassy in Washington, DC. In order uh, that they are seating, next we have Andreas Kramer, who's the founder and director emeritus of the Ecologic Institute in Berlin. Beside him, we have Chris King, who's Global Chief Regulatory Officer for, uh, for Smart Grid Services at Siemens. Next to him, we have Michael Melling, Executive Director of the Center for Energy and Environmental Policy Research at MIT. Beside him, we have Eleanor Stein, Advisor for Special Projects at the Department of Public Service. And finally, we are very lucky to have Justin Gillis here, reporter of the New York Times, to moderate the discussion. So thank you very much. I'll hand it off to Georg, who's going to say a few short remarks. Good morning and welcome everybody. I'm really excited to be here and uh, have this wonderful event starting soon. Let me just uh, steal one minute of your time to explain a little bit uh, what the Transatlantic Climate Bridge actually stands for. You're all wondering what this nice little logo stands for. Actually, um, it's a project platform which was founded in 2008 by the Foreign Ministry in Germany and the Ministry for Environmental Affairs. And uh, the idea was to strengthen the cooperation between the United States and Germany, particularly in the year 2008, you know, when Copenhagen was coming, and find energy and climate solution. That was the idea, actually. And I think we did all kind of uh, efforts and projects since then in the field of uh, energy efficient water treatment, renewable energy, energy efficient in general, and of course, uh, all the issues um, related with a smart and sustainable energy supply. And actually last year, we, we started the cooperation between New York State and Germany, and uh, we could uh, ask, we asked Ecologic and Susan Hunt to provide uh, an expert group from New York State which visited Germany on a very exciting energy trip. So this was, so you could say, the first step in the cooperation between our two states, and today is the second step, and we're looking for energy solutions. And I think we have a common vision so that we are moving towards uh, energy transition, the Energiewende, what we call it in Germany, and I'm 
uh, absolutely aware that New York State is also moving towards that direction. I'm thrilled to, to hear what experts say where our cooperation can uh, make progress. So with no further ado, uh, thank you all for being here and uh, didn't stay outside at this wonderful and beautiful weather and made it to the cellar room and participate in this fantastic event. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you, everybody, for coming uh, and sitting, uh, as Geert said, in a windowless room on a beautiful spring day in New York. Uh, we live in a remarkable uh, time. Uh, uh, we are dealing with an urgent global environmental crisis. Uh, it's been urgent for a long time, but we have finally reached the point where uh, a lot of the public is, uh, seems to be understanding that uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. We also live in a time when the tools that just might conceivably allow us to uh, solve or at least mitigate that problem are uh, coming into existence and prices are falling to the point that you could begin to think about um, doing something truly ambitious. Uh, I work at the New York Times and we've been, um, uh, you know, among, among few newspapers in the world sort of on this for a long, long time. Uh, uh, a year ago, uh, I wanted to do a piece uh, asking the question, you know, where do we go given these uh, technology trends, given the urgency of the problem? Uh, and, of course, the, the idea came up immediately, uh, let's go look at Germany. I mean, you sort of look, you know, you, one of the things you do in this kind of situation is look for models around the world. Who's ahead of us? And um, so I flew to Germany uh, a year ago in April, uh, basically with the idea in my head that, uh, boy, it's remarkable that uh, they've gotten this sort of 30% or they're approaching 30% renewable in their electricity system. I spent two weeks there and came back saying to myself, boy, there's a lot of blood on the floor. Uh, uh, the the uh, market valuations of the utilities, the big German utilities have been cut in half as the uh, energy transition, the Energiewende has taken hold. Uh, uh, the uh, pace of the change uh, has exceeded the government's own uh, expectations. In fact, it pretty clearly got ahead of them as they uh, kept the prices high, the sort of subsidies fairly high, and the prices of, of uh, particularly solar power fell. Uh, it became so economic to do that there was this mad rush, and the, the amount of renewables on the grid sort of got well ahead of uh, of, of uh, German planning and expectation. Uh, so we're going to talk about all that today, and I think the question, you know, I, I'm not interested in either of these sort of dug-in ideological positions. You know, the, the Greens sort of only want to see this as a success story. Uh, the, uh, you know, the climate denialists and people like that want to see it as a sort of debacle. I think the real question is, how do we make this a success? And how do we, how do we in the United States, who have maybe at this point the fortune to be a little behind the Germans, look at what they've done and say, let's, let's gain the benefits of that, but without the problems. How do we uh, go where they're going in terms of climate policy without uh, you know, destroying our utility industry in the process? Uh, the state of New York, as it happens, is in the middle of thinking deeply about that right now. Uh, and one of my uh, folks up on stage here is going to talk to us about that. We, uh, uh, New York may be behind California in terms of sort of actual rollout and deployment, but I would argue that right now New York is ahead of California in thinking about uh, what the future electricity markets uh, ought to look like. So. Um, uh, we're fortunate to have a fabulous panel up here to talk about all this. I'm going to start with Michael Melling of MIT. He's also got an association with Andreas's Institute, the Ecologic Institute, I think, one of the world's major uh, environmental think tanks. Michael, tell us what the Energiewende is. What are the Germans trying to do? Justin, um, thank you, absolutely. And if I go slightly over five minutes, I'll make sure I use it or I deduct it from my subsequent comments. Um, so in a given, can you pull your? Does it work? Can yeah. you hear me? Closer, closer. Yeah, you got to really. Yeah, that's my notes, which I can hardly read anymore. So in a given, as a term, is probably best translated as energy turnaround. 
It's not a very nice way of, not a very catchy phrase, but that's really the literal meaning. Usually it's translated as energy transition or energy transformation, but it, it gives you sort of a sense of, of what it means. The term itself goes back to a book which came out um, in 1980, which Andreas has here on the table. Um, interestingly, and this is a, a narrative that goes through sort of the history of many instruments and many policies in Germany, most of the ideas in that book were sort of already captured and framed by Amory Lovins here in the US in 1976 in an article on the road not taken in energy policy, in which she sort of contrasts a hard path of energy policy and a soft path. Let me take you back to um, the late 80s in Germany. In fact, um, a very conservative legislator from Bavaria, my home state, um, the Christian Social Union, CSU, at the end of his legislative term, not necessarily very friendly with environmental policies, but his family had owned a hydro generation plant for over 100 years. And he had time and again faced the battle with the local utility about the prices that he would get for the power he was selling to that utility. He would typically get a few cents only per kilowatt hour, lower than the generation cost of the utility itself, actually. There was just no framework to, to give him sort of a, a fair negotiating position. So he had this idea, partly based on, on the writings and discussions that had been happening in Germany at the time, um, that there should be something that, that makes it fairer and gives more certainty to all those distributed generators, be it hydropower or other forms of, of um, distributed um, electricity generation. And he teamed up with a, um, a Greens a member of parliament at the time. They worked out a very short, very, very, um, um, let's say, simple law of two pages, five provisions, which essentially said that those who feed in electricity to the grid should have a guarantee that that electricity would be purchased and the prices should be transparently fixed based on a percentage share of, of the average retail price the utilities can charge. And the cost for that would be laid over to all the rate payers. That's the concept of the feed-in tariff. Interestingly, now, the feed-in tariff also can be traced back to the United States. The 1978 PURPA Act, in a way, contains a mechanism. Carter had this idea of promoting um, um, domestic energies that also is very, very similar to a feed-in tariff. So again, you can sort of trace an intellectual history to the United States. So 1990, um, when this act passed, Germany was distracted by the, by the reunification, by the massive challenge of getting Eastern Germany underway again. Of course, the big utilities were also very much distracted by that. Nobody really thought that this was going to be very consequential. In fact, a social democrat in, in parliament said, huh, this is wiggling your small toes. What is this really going to achieve? In 1991, there were about 1,000 wind turbines in Germany. By 1999, with the simple act, it reached 10,000. The act wasn't particularly powerful in promoting some technologies like PV. And so when the government change in the red and green coalition um, came to power in 98, one of their big projects was also to strengthen the legislation that promotes renewables. Um, at the time, there were again distractions that sort of prevented maybe utilities from fully capturing the, the magnitude of what this could eventually lead to and anticipating the challenges that Justin has alluded to. Um, one thing was um, the, the coalition was also introducing an ecological tax reform, so an, 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 a tax on electricity for the first time. But there was also a nuclear phase out that had been agreed. It's I Michael, it's off. your cell phone. Now. I turned off the, the signal, so it's in airplane mode. It shouldn't do that. Comes and goes. Seems OK. Sorry, and folks. this act introduced a few tweaks. Um, it, it based the, the feed-in tariff, that which generators receive for their electricity that they feed in, on the technology cost plus sort of a, a surplus. It extended the guaranteed rate that was fixed in the legislation for 20 years. Um, and um, it also ensured that every new installation that would start getting, you know, for 20 years the same rate, year after year would be getting less so that you know, a new installation in 2001 got less than one in 2000, and 2002 less than in 2001. But whenever you installed, whenever you added renewable generation, you got the, the, the rate for 20 years, that didn't change. It's just the subsequent generations, your neighbor that might have been a bit later, got less. Very importantly, this is not a public subsidy. This is a price support scheme. Some lawyers would argue that it still works as a subsidy, but it did not go through the public budget. It's not funded by taxpayers. Now, you've seen sort of what that has achieved by now. You, you have uh, the materials with the chart of the growth of renewables. I think it's very important also to highlight that, you know, even though it went from 10% to 30% in the last decade, 
the real change, the real growth is in the variable renewable solar and wind and also in dispatchable biomass. Hydro has remained largely unchanged. And in areas like solar, the growth has been much, much more. It's been many, many, many times. Um, so it's, it's multiples, literally. You see it's an exponential growth. Um, where do we stand now with that policy? There's been many changes to the law initially to strengthen it, uh, early amendments later to um, actually start dealing with the fact or the problem that it may have been too effective in some areas, especially as technology costs for photovoltaics fell. So there was also efforts to curb the growth a little bit. Um, the, the laws, the recent, the latest amendments push sort of the incentives more towards direct marketing in competition with other energy sources. Large producers will enter auctioning, um, bidding for auctions. So it is changing the whole model somewhat, but the, the principle is still the same. Right now, ratepayers, households, pay 6.17 cents per kilowatt hour in addition to what they would pay without the feed-in tariff. So that's the surcharge that they're bearing so that those who feed in renewable electricity receive their guaranteed tariffs. Um, and that adds about 250 euros per household per year. It's relevant, but it's not like breaking the bank completely. Interestingly, industry and, and, and larger commercial um, endeavors are exempted, which has its own effects. And I think Andreas will talk about that somewhat, and Chris perhaps as well. Um, there's a green book on market, um, on electricity market reform that was published last year, and a white book should be published this year, which will discuss a major sort of paradigm shift. Do we continue with the energy only market in which economic dispatch is based purely on, and payments are based purely on energy delivered? Or do we also have to start thinking about funding, paying for capacity? So just providing capacity rather than actually selling energy. There's a, lots of controversy about that. I think a majority of people agree that a more flexible, improved energy-only market is the way forward. But that's sort of the history and where we stand with the, um, with the in a given environment. OK, thank you very much. And uh, Andreas, give us your assessment um, uh, of how this policy is working. Uh, uh, you know, why is it that we've seen the utilities lose uh, half their value? How could they not have seen this coming? Um, what are the pros and cons of the policy as it's played out so far? Great, thank you, Justin. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the United States, not only for the points um, that Michael has already raised, um, uh, the soft path and the hard path, uh, but also when I was beginning to work in this sector in the 1980s, I was citing um, papers from the University of California at Davis up and down in my own work uh, because California was at the time the place to be when you were interested in wind power. Um, we took that from the US and built on it. Well, not we, um, the Germans, it, went through Denmark for a while. The same with photovoltaics. It was uh, developed by NASA for powering satellites. It developed in Japan when um, uh, the US dropped the ball, and then later on it went to Germany, and now it is in China. Those are international technologies, and I think the world owes a lot to the United States on those technologies. And we also have a number of regulatory philosophies, um, sector reform models that were developed in the 1970s and 80s in the United States. And they washed over the Atlantic, and they created a new competitive framework that allowed the energy vendor to succeed, and at the same time, resulted in competitive pressures, um, uh, reducing the profitability and the, the room for maneuver for the big fossil and nuclear utilities that we still have the, as the incumbents. Um, another thing I want to say is Germany is not an outlier. Germany doesn't have the highest share of renewables in the power supply. We do not have the largest, the fastest growth of renewable electricity in our sector. Um, uh, we don't have, out, we have not outlawed um, nuclear power as some other uh, European countries have done. Wherever you are, whether it is economically or legally and even physically, um, uh, Germany is more at the center in the mainstream of Europe rather than an outlier. Um, the effect of the policy so far has been, and that is in response to your question, the ch creation of a new business, renewable electricity production, that is worth about 40 billion euros per year. The sector employs just under 400,000 staff members, employees. These businesses and these um, uh, people working in the industry, they all pay taxes, they all pay social security charges, 
and it washes literally billions of euros every year into the uh, public treasury and into the social security systems. They would be poorer without it. It's sometimes forgotten, um, and people who criticize the energy venice policy like to point out that there are subsidies involved in stimulating these uneconomic renewable uh, energies. And it's simply wrong. They're not subsidies because they're not paid for by the public purse, so they do not put a stress um, on uh, taxpayers. Um, as a result of Germany producing electricity internally on its own territory, um, every kilowatt hour that we generate is a kilowatt hour that we have to buy less fossil fuel for. So we have reduced our import of fossil energy and that has helped our balances of trade and of payment. If Germany is successful, economically successful today, it's in part because we've been pursuing Energiewende policies continuously for 35 years with accelerating speed. So rather than being a drain on the um, national economy, the Energiewende is actually largely um, beneficial uh, in addition to also avoiding the uninsurably high risks of uh, nuclear accidents and the legacy costs that have not been funded so far. Uh, we have a number of um, additional benefits that are non-economic in terms of um, um, soft power people like Germany uh, addressing this issue in that way. Uh, the total cost of this policy is neg negligible. Uh, when you look at the total cost of power supply in Germany as a percentage of GDP, it was about 2% in 1990, it went down to about 1.8% in 2000 and we are now back to 2.1%. So basically, it's flat over time. When you look at the national economy as a whole, the Energiewende actually doesn't cost anything beyond business as usual. And that is with the starting point that Germany had. When we started this policy, um, electricity from photovoltaic panels was very expensive. Onshore and offshore was very expensive. Um, today, the starting point in, in New York State is much, much better. The technologies, renewable electricity is much, much cheaper across the board in all the technologies and the price for uh, the alternatives has gone up. What's the effect? The winners and the losers, and this is my final point. The losers are the old utilities and you heard about the collapse in their um, uh, market capitalization and their total shareholder value. That's the price for not seeing the writing on the wall and insisting on investing in fossil and nuclear assets well beyond the time when it made sense to do so. And the punishment in, a, in, a, in an economy based on competition, the punishment for making wrong decisions is that eventually you can go bankrupt. Um, if we do not allow that penalty to be there, then um, we would end up like the Soviet Union where the beneficial impacts of um, competition could not play out. The other losers are the households because they have to pay uh, through the renewable electricity charge the cost of the policy. Uh, as a result, electricity prices for retail customers, for household customers have gone up. Um, but not as much as the price for um, fuel for the car, gas for the car, or fuel for the heating bill. Um, so it's not an outrageous increase in electricity prices, but it is within the range that we have for other um, uh, uh, retail functions as well. The big winners, apart from the taxman that I already indicated, are new utilities. We have a number of new utilities that owe their business model, their existence to this policy. And whenever people complain about the capitalization of the old utilities going down, you should also set against that the gain in capital value um, uh, of the new utilities that have been created. And the biggest winner is German industry. You can now buy electricity in Germany at 3.3, 3.4 euro cents per kilowatt hour um, on the um, uh, electricity market. And if you think that this is an outlier, you can lock in the prices to the end of 2017 already in the uh, futures markets. So uh, German industry, we now get inward investment into Germany because of the low um, uh, electricity prices and the uh, expectation that the electricity prices for industry will remain low for a very long time. Thank you. Michael, do you want to give a quick response to that? And, and uh, what, what did Andreas not point out that maybe ought to be pointed out to our audience before we, we shift into a discussion of uh, what the Americans can learn from all this? I would never dare to suggest that Andreas did not mention something that he should have. No, I wanted to actually, see, I'm, I'm, I'm 
Texan, one half of me is Texan, the other half is Bavarian. So one interest of mine, as you might understand, has always been trying to make sense of these fairly different trajectories that the two jurisdictions, that the two regions have um, undergone in, in, especially in energy and, and environmental policy. Um, and even though, as I suggested, and Andreas also um, confirmed, there's been a lot of interesting transfers and, and very useful transfers, especially for Europe, um, right now we'd agree probably that, that the differences are quite stark. Um, so my, my attempt here would be very briefly just to think about what's transferable and, and what not. Um, and I think one's tempted to first look at the geophysical differences. Obviously, I mean, the United States is vastly larger than, than, than Germany, much, much less densely populated, which has incredible ramifications in terms of, you know, building infrastructure, building efficiency, public transport opportunities, et cetera. There's no doubt about that. It may also make it harder to, to have, let's say, very well integrated transmission grids across long distances, perhaps in some parts of the country. But at the same time, the United States is so much more um, endowed with natural resources, including renewable resources. Only Alaska has about as much sun as Germany. Every other state would have much, much more efficient, um, you know, solar panels just would create so much more um, electricity with the same capacity, with the same technology, that I can't explain it purely on geophysical limits. Some people might point to shale gas. Of course, that, that is potentially you know, a competitor in some ways. But at the same time, and people rightly pointed out, if you think of it as a bridge, it's the perfect ally um, for a certain amount of time to couple it to complement renewables because of the ability of ramping up and down and dispatching um, natural gas turbines. So I think you know, the geophysics is not the explanation per se. And that's good, because that's something you can't change easily, um, and, and certainly not in short time, obviously. So it must be somewhere in the social, cultural, political realm. Um, and of course, many people will then say, well, Germans are just, you know, they're so much more environmentally conscious. Um, why is that? Of course, there's always interesting stories behind that. And, and they're willing to pay so much more for environmental policy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they trust public authority, they trust science more, all those things we don't have across the board in the US perhaps, and so it'll be harder forever. I, I, you know, I think that's not necessarily the case. I think the narratives may be different. I think um, in the US another narrative has been very successful, the do-it-yourself, hands-on, energy independence narrative of having your own solar panel and being independent from the big corporate grid or the big corporate utilities, for instance. So I think maybe different narratives, but I still think it's not going to be the cultural aspect alone. So that leaves us perhaps with the legal and institutional structures. And there, I fear, you know, that that is perhaps um, one of the most important explanations of these divergent paths. And there could be also an obstacle to replicating some of the successes and trying to avoid some of the, let's say, um, challenges that have been encountered in Germany. Clearly, the fact that um, sort of the, the legislative authority, federal and state, is somewhat reversed in Germany makes it easier. The party system, multi-party system, party discipline um, has been a, a factor, I think, in Germany as well. Um, and historical opportunities, the fact that, you know, in 1990 there were distractions in the east of Germany in 2000, other things that happened. We didn't have at that time an economics minister of, so it was a social green, a social democrat green coalition. The economics minister was independent at the time. We know for a fact that the later social democrat appointed economics minister, Wolfgang Clement, would have been much, much, let's say, harder to convince about the reform of, of of the Renewable Energy Act at the time. Um, so yes, historical opportunity chance plays a role too. But all in all, I think what's important is these things can change. Legislation can change. Uh, institutional structures can change. This is where I would hand over to, to Eleanor because I think New York is showing how those things can happen. It takes time, but it happens. OK, so we've started jumping the Atlantic. Let's, let's go all the way and uh, talk about New York State. Uh, the uh, New York Public Service Commission, which Eleanor is here representing, is running uh, a proceeding right now called Reforming the Energy Vision, uh, in which their stated goal is to uh, sort of get us to the future and figure out what these markets ought to look like uh, and what kind of reform is, is needed. Uh, Eleanor, tell us about that. What are you guys doing? What are you, what, where are you going? And how far along are we on that road? Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so... Uh, I'm delighted to be here. I came here for the discussion with representatives from the UK talking about the Rio project and REV, and that was wonderful, and this is a, a wonderful opportunity for New York. And it's, of course, not only an academic discussion. We're here in an academic institution. But it also has tremendous practical implications. And the urgency, as Justin opened with, is the climate change challenge. 
And uh, today we are in a very desperate situation. We, for the first time in human history, in February of this year, uh, the uh, concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere exceeded 400 parts per million, and for the first time in, in 800,000 years for the planet. And um, so these measures that are done by cities and states and countries and hopefully globally in Paris in December are of tremendous import. And that's, that's the framing for me, that's a framing context for all of this discussion. Um, I'm going to just briefly look at three things, the challenges that New York faces, the vision that the state is putting forward and working to implement, and finally a little bit about implementation since I noticed that my topic is um, what is the current state of REV, so I need to sort of bring it up to date. So um, first let me say that the REV uh, proceeding and the REV process at the State Public Service Commission is just part of a statewide initiative um, which is as indicated throughout government has been strongly supported and advocated for by Governor Cuomo and is seen in the New York Green Bank, uh, K-Solar, New York Sun, and many other programs to, uh, to increase the penetration of renewable energy in New York and other aspects of REV. And I would say that there's a few factors that impelled the commission to look at the need for some serious change. And I think many of these are similar to the ones that were described in Germany, but I'll just list a few. Uh, obviously, I started with climate, and so just to follow that on, you know, we've had programs to bring renewable energy into the system in New York for over 10 years, and they've had, they've had some successes. Uh, but we're in a situation now where we need, uh, I would say, um, an order of magnitude different level of investment in these technologies to fully integrate renewable energy into the lifeblood of the grid. And we can no longer just look to the ratepayers in New York, the electric customers, the gas customers, to shoulder that burden. We need other sources of investment. And REV is an attempt to integrate private investment into renewables and create a, si a system that will allow that investment to bear fruit. And um, so that would be the first challenge, the need for a huge, huge infusion of renewable energy. And, and that's one of the main reasons we're looking to the German model and looking at all the lessons of the German model to see how they might apply for us. But New York also has several other challenges, which I think some may be the same, some may be different. Uh, first of all, uh, we have, although we have a very reliable energy system, it's also very inefficient kind of as a mechanism. A uh, huge amount of uh, energy is, uh, or a huge amount of our infrastructure for energy is dedicated to providing energy in a few hours in the year where New York's energy demand peaks, as it's called, uh, at, at a level of twice the normal usage. So you know when that is. That's the hottest days of summer when everybody in New York ramps up their air conditioning at the same time. And it, an energy system has to be able to meet those peaks. Uh, but that does create a, a real efficiency in design. And peak load is growing in New York five times faster than base load. So it's a problem that is increasingly severe. And we think there's things we can do about it. The second is New York has an aging infrastructure so much so that our state uh, independent system operator has estimated that we need to invest over $30 billion in just replacement of infrastructure over the next 10 years. That's twice as much as we invested in the last 10 years. So again, we have an escalating problem. Uh, and that clearly leads to uh, the problem of, of the cost of electricity for New Yorkers. And um, these potential investments mean a, a substantial, will mean a substantial increase in the prices that customers pay for electricity. And uh, we are committed to affordability of electricity. You know you can't participate in modern society without access to a reliable, high-grade source of power all the time. We're all here wired up so much so that our devices are interfering with each other and preventing this transmission from going ahead. So. That's a constraint on, and here it is. On cue. I conjured it up, I'm sorry. Uh, so that's a constraint. You know, in New York, almost 16% of New Yorkers are more than 90 days past due in paying their electricity bills. That's a very substantial problem. Um, so, uh, and, and finally, and I could list others, but there's one other one, which is that 
uh, the ability of New York customers to uh, take an active role in controlling their energy usage and having strategies for how to reduce their bills is limited by the fact that their communications with their utility are one way and usually just take the form of getting a bill in the mail once a month or maybe online once a month or maybe it's once every two months. Uh, so the whole r realm of information technology, which runs so many of our decisions as consumers, is really not available in the electric sector, where you would think it's kind of a natural fit. So the commission looked at these challenges and considered, you know, you could meet them by kind of clinging to a traditional model, delaying the change, uh, keeping the same regulatory structure and market structure, or you could look for a way to create new value for customers to uh, engage the markets in uh, renewable production and to embrace technological changes. And uh, the commission decided, um, uh, and they said in its decision at the end of February, we decisively take the latter approach. So I'll just spend a couple of minutes on what this energy vision is, um, how we intend to meet the challenges. The first is viewing the grid as uh, an integrated single machine or I like to think of it as an organism, uh, because each customer can play uh, an active role in the workings of the grid. All, every customer premises, every customer electric device or piece of electronics is potentially a producer of electricity or a reducer of demand. And if we can genuinely integrate the reduction of demand into the way we do energy, we can, we can level out that peak so that it doesn't drive so much of our investment. We can have a far more efficient system, and customers can be empowered to really make decisions and activate those decisions with their own technologies. And, uh, and by doing so, we can recognize the, the value of um, demand reduction and renewable generation, all the values that those technologies bring to the grid and assign them values and make them and monetize them. And that's one of the goals of REV. And it sounds abstract, so I'll just give you a concrete example. Uh, in in uh, the Brownsville area of Brooklyn, Con Edison, about a year and a half ago, had identified a need for additional uh, electricity in the area, additional capacity. And so they made a proposal, as they generally do, traditionally, to build some more of their infrastructure. And they proposed to build a new substation in the Brownsville area that for a cost of about $1.3 billion. And uh, many of the parties involved in that, in that proceeding and the commission and New York City, uh, many people who've been involved, and many of you, I think, were involved in the examination of Con Edison's resilience strategies following Superstorm Sandy, came in with some different proposals and looked at this as a possible opportunity to try something different. And instead of simply building another supply center, why not use this as an opportunity to put out a request for information to the community and to the industry and say, what else is out there? Are there some possibilities that could be used to meet this need other than the traditional one, which is essentially bringing in more fossil fuel generation through the traditional infrastructure? And that's an ongoing project, uh, but it is, I understand that it's been very productive, that there have been many, many responses, and I'll just give you a, just, uh, this is not a project which was actually a response to it, but it's something else that's being developed by people in the Brownsville community, looking at, can, at the idea of organizing tenants in public housing to, to come together as a cooperative to reduce their electric usage and in a concerted way in, in such a form that the utility can rely on it so that they could act, and they would actually be selling back to Con Edison this demand reduction asset or resource. And this opens, this is a whole other way to look at how to run a system. And I don't know if that project will come to life or not, but it, it's a very challenging way to think about how you could run the grid very differently. And of course, these assets are in addition to the central generation, the central grid, our transmission systems, and the assets of the utility. They're not a replacement. So um, the other uh, thing I would just mention is why would we think it's possible to do this and to make these changes? And I just will cite two examples that I think you'll find interesting. One is that when the commission began this proceeding, we held a series of working groups, convened working groups, to do a data gathering exercise to find out what was out there in the market. And we held the first meeting, 400 people showed up. And actually, 
you can't you can't give a party in Rev without 400 people showing up. It's actually a problem. Um, so, and they were, I'd say two thirds of them were distributed energy resource providers from all over the country and some from Europe who were coming here saying, if you open up this market and create the kind of grid where we can play a role, we will be here. We're looking for a way to play. And Siemens, I will say, is one of them has been very involved in the development of the case. Uh, the second reason why I think this is doable is that I was part of a team that went out on a, a public statement hearing tour. I think of it as our road show. We went to eight cities in February. So come with me to Buffalo and Syracuse and Rochester in February, and you will see some dedicated customers. We spoke to over a thousand people on this tour, and, and it was a real eye-opener. And mainly people said, we're very excited in the potential of this. We want to participate. Our communities want to take on for ourselves, directing our energy future. We as customers want to take this on. We want more renewables. We want more energy efficiency, and we're concerned about climate. Those were key responses, very heartening. So I'll just close by just giving you a couple of updates on implementation, kind of where we are now. Uh, it's beginning to be something that's not just on paper. So we have the Brownsville project and all the utilities are now doing what we're calling demonstration projects. So they are, uh, they are finding uh, alternative ways to meet their uh, the energy requirements of their service territories. And we are going to be gathering that data and learning from each of these demonstrations and see what works the best. Some of them are coming from communities, like this Brooklyn project I told you about. And some are coming from market participants and businesses that are aggregating demand or building solar farms and so on. Uh, and we've convened a group, a working group, to design those market protocols and look at what kind of platform technology will be needed to truly make this an interactive uh, and distributed grid. And that group is going to be uh, pu publishing its report in July. All of this is available on the Commission's website, all this information. Our staff is also developing a way to look at costs and benefits uh, for REV, going, looking out to the future. And they will soon be uh, filing a proposal on the rate making aspects. How does the Commission's rate setting uh, pr uh, practices encourage utilities to open up the market and reward them for doing so, rather than, as they traditionally have done, reward them for putting more infrastructure into the ground. Um, finally, uh, in January of next year, the utilities will each be filing a distributed system inter uh, implementation plan, and we'll begin to see the utilities each having their own business plans to make this all happen. So that's, what, that's where we are today. Thank you. Thank you, Eleanor. Um, uh, last but definitely not least, uh, we have with us Chris King from uh, Siemens, uh, one of the major companies in the world, and I'd point out uh, a major competitor to General Electric, a New York um, company, uh, selling uh, uh, generation assets, both conventional and renewable uh, assets. Uh, they also sell and consult on, I think, uh, smart grid services and, and uh, uh, developments. Chris, I'm going to give you the task today of sort of representing all of industry in the world. Uh, <laughs> Uh, talk to us about uh, what you've just heard and uh, where industry sees all this going. I believe we've reached the point already where more than half of the new generation uh, investment going on on the planet is renewable. Uh, we, we, where are we heading and what are guys like you worried about? Thank you, Justin. Um, I, don't, I don't know if it mentions in my bio that I'm a serial entrepreneur and actually my company was bought by Siemens, so I'm here sitting representing Siemens, but coming from a small company just a couple of years ago. But um, as an uh, entrepreneur and as Siemens, uh, we tend to be very pragmatic in looking at the world and we kind of look at two different things. We look at what are the challenges out there and therefore what opportunities do those challenges create. So let me bring that perspective to this. And I'm going to list three of each at a high level, and uh, hopefully we can, uh, or we'll discuss uh, whatever's of interest. Um, so on the challenges side, uh, when we look at electricity, uh, three fundamental challenges. The first is the physics of electricity. It has to be balanced in real time. If I turn on a switch here, there has to be a, a generator somewhere on the grid connected uh, that provides the electrons that makes the light go on. At the same time, it's all interconnected. So if I have a solar panel on my roof, that's going to affect the grid 
I have it in California, it's gonna affect the grid here in New York in a very tiny way. But you add up all those, those rooftops and you actually have a significant effect. So it's, it's all interconnected, which uh, sort of leads to reg regulation. And another key thing that's driven by those physics is storage. Sometimes you hear that storage is the holy grail of solving some of these issues. Wind and solar energy are fantastic, but they are not there all the time. You can't turn them on and off when you need them. You sort of have to accept them, and then you have to have other resources to back them up. So physics is a, is a key area we look at in terms of challenges. A uh, second area of challenge is regulatory complexity. And I'll give you a couple of examples of that. Um, the interconnectedness of electricity leads to, in some part, the regulatory complexity. But there are specific examples as well. So I'm looking at Germany. Uh, one of the key infrastructures that enables some of this interactive grid is uh, data, smart metering, smart technologies. Uh, Germany has come out with a 300-page regulation around data privacy and protection around smart meters, which is wonderful to, as far as protecting consumers, but in terms of coming up with a technology that can then be delivered at a low cost to provide the capability is very challenging. And the other challenge is that it's different. It's different in Germany from the UK, from New York, from California, and so on. Uh, another example you might think of is your own utility bill. And I would, uh, I, know, I know I can't, even with all my years in the industry, I cannot reconstruct every element of my bill. And it turns out that actually the only people who can are the programmers who actually program the billing system because there's so many elements to it. So you have this complexity that's, uh, that, tends, that often happens, but not always, and I'll come back to that. And then the third thing that we see out there is some unintended or unexpected consequences. So we've heard about the increase in, in lignite consumption in Germany that is loosely connected with the uh, renewable energy policy. And when I say loosely, what I mean is that uh, with the, the uh, large increase in renewable energy on the system, wholesale prices have been driven down. Uh, naturally, you have a lot more supply, so the, the price goes down. The demand is similar, uh, pretty much unchanged. And then um, what that has done is it has driven natural gas-fired power plants pretty much out of the market. So they're no longer economic. In fact, you've had brand new natural gas plants in Germany that have been mothballed because they couldn't operate economically. Now, this resulted in the, the wonderful effect for industry of very low prices on the market but it also is uh, putting these major utilities into bankruptcy. Um, not saying whether any of that's all good or bad, it's just that these are consequences that came about uh, as a result of the policy that were not, uh, uh, perhaps they were expected by some, but certainly not uh, generally. Another example is taking a power grid that was designed for one-way power flows and then turning it into a two-way grid. How do we do that? What's that gonna take? What consequences will that have on the grid and reliability? And that's where REV is doing, uh, as just one example of doing a really good job of saying, well, we know that it's gonna create some questions, if not issues, so let's take a look at those and understand those. Another one that we're starting to see on the unintended consequences is curtailment. We've had the luxury so far of being able to say, well, let's take all the solar and wind that's produced. Now we're starting to run into situations where, well, we've got a little too much solar, a little too much wind at a certain time of day. We don't have the storage, as I mentioned. So we need to think about how do we curtail that. Um, there have been a couple of cases, one in the Northwest. Do we pour water over dams or we do, do we turn off wind turbines? Both are terrible results. So how do we solve some of those problems? So those are challenges. The physics, the regulatory complexity, and then looking out for unintended consequences. So how, how does industry come back and turn these into opportunities? Well, one of them, of course, is the innovation economy. I mean, this creates all sorts of opportunities that we've taken advantage, we, other companies. Um, Justin mentioned our wind. Uh, we sell a lot of wind turbines. We also sell a lot of energy efficiency, um, not as well known perhaps by Siemens, but these are great opportunities in technology, providing the IT technologies that Eleanor was referring to to help turn this, modernize this grid. On the jobs front, 
uh, it came up earlier, the number of jobs. In fact, uh, one number I saw for Germany was that there are two and a half times more jobs in the renewable economy in Germany than in the coal industry, two and a half times. I know that the U.S. number uh, is, um, I don't know the ratio, but I know it's, it's much higher for renewable jobs. Another um, area of the innovation economy is something that touches all of us, which is home automation, home convenience. Uh, Nest, think of Nest th smart thermostats. So these are all opportunities in innovation. Uh, second opportunity is in regulatory policy. And, uh, so I said earlier that that complexity is a huge issue, which it is, uh, but on the policy side, there are some real opportunities. One of them is lessons learned from other areas. What can we learn from Germany? What can Germany learn from New York? Um, and in my job, I, I work globally and everyone is doing different things. Uh, electricity is the same everywhere, but regulation is actually different everywhere. And there's uh, much that can be learned looking around. So one of the key uh, lessons that I would highlight is simplicity. Uh, one reason there is so much uh, renewable energy in Germany is a very simple feed-in tariff. An investor could look at that, they knew it would know exactly how much money they were gonna get over the life of that technology and they could decide invest yay or nay get into complex regulations, it makes it very different, difficult to make investment decisions. Uh, so simplicity is important. Um, drawing the line, this um, California has also a very uh, powerful consumer data protection policy, which really boils down to two or three pages in a commission decision as opposed to uh, the, what I mentioned in Germany as another example. Another one is incentives. And this is something that was highlighted in the New York Rev Track 1 order that came out. Utilities traditionally, and for very good reasons, have been incentivized, or not necessarily incentivized, but uh, regulators have given utilities recovery of their operating costs, as well as a return of their capital and a return on their capital. And this was wonderful when you were getting growth in consumption, you needed more power plants, and so your main decision there was, well, how do we invest this money wisely in more power plants? But that, of course, is now completely different. We actually need fewer power plants in many cases, or we need only peaking power plants, or we have that issue to deal with. So the, the result of that system was an incentive to invest in capital. And one of the things that's being looked at in the in track two in New York is, well, how do we change that? How do we come up with a new incentive structure that recognizes this fact and looks at other things. Another example is in IT technology where the incentive has been let's invest in a big customized software package because that goes into our rate base and we earn return on that capital. Well, what about cloud systems that are now out there and that can be more efficient? And then my final point, my third point in opportunities, innovation, regulatory policy, and the third is, comes back to something else Eleanor said, which is activate the demand side or animate the demand side in the words of New York. Get customers, get prosumers involved, and we see that taking three things. One is pricing slash economic incentives. For this housing, uh, this building in Brooklyn, that's gonna respond with demand reductions, they have to be paid for that, otherwise it's not in their interest to do that. I mean, they might do it once or twice out of social reasons, but on an ongoing reliable basis, they have to be paid for that. How do you measure that? How do you compensate that? So pricing is one. The second is technology, make it easy. Give them smart thermostats so it happens automatically. People don't wanna sit and think about it and run around turning things off. If you've got an automated system to do that, much easier, much pref more preferable. And then the third is, is actually first, which is information. Uh, give customers the information to understand how they're using energy so that they can manage that. So this is the empowerment uh, triad of information pricing and technology. So uh, in sum, those would be the key challenges and the key opportunities that we see from all this. Okay, thank you, Chris. And uh, thanks to all my panelists. Uh, we are getting close to the point where we will take questions from the audience, so start sharpening your teeth. Um, uh, we also, you will see me sneaking a glance every now and then at my iPad. I'm not being rude. We have uh, questions coming, I think, from the staff of the PSC, among others, uh, by email, and so uh, we may take questions that way. 
Um, I want to start out by throwing a couple of big um, issues uh, open to my panelists and let them, um, let them comment. If you talk to people who are um, visionaries, who have a track record as visionaries on this issue, if you were lucky enough to have breakfast with Amory Lovins, as I was a few months ago, uh, what you hear is the innovation we need right now is not primarily technological. Uh, the innovation we really need most urgently is innovation in markets and innovation in uh, prices and in the way this whole thing is set up. We're dealing with a really bizarre commodity in electricity in the sense that it has to be sort of uh, created and sold to you in the same instant. Uh, we've historically thought of that as a sort of a one-way problem where you took the demand as given and the problem for industry was to, to, to supply that demand. Uh, uh, you, you, especially in this era where devices are getting smarter and smarter, uh, you don't necessarily have to think about it that way anymore. Um, I, I would cite the example of the uh, telecommunications industry. Uh, back, you know, when I was a kid in the 70s, you know, we had sort of one giant national phone company and uh, you could call them up and you got either a black phone or maybe you got the sort of brand new pink princess phone and those were sort of your choices. Uh, and, you know, some really smart economists started arguing, wait a minute, you know, the only true natural monopoly here, if there's a natural monopoly at all, is the wires. It's not the phones, it's not uh, the long distance, et cetera, et cetera. And so we had a ruling in 1984, I believe, in which the, the, the substantive effect of that ruling was to quarantine the monopoly, to quarantine the wires, and open up other aspects of the telecommunication system to innovation. And, you know, that set off 25 years of innovation, the result of which I can hold in my hand up here, and all of you probably have a, a smartphone as well. People will argue, do argue, that we need to get there in the electricity business. You can imagine very easily, a dishwasher that sort of sniffs the, the grid and says, wait a minute, prices are high right now, I'm not going to turn myself on, but then at four in the morning, prices have dropped, I'm going to turn myself on and, and wash the dishes. Uh, Chris alluded to some of this, you know, we've already got a company called Nest that's selling a lot of smart thermostats to people. Uh, you know, Nest is reaching the point where they're going to be able to bid into what are called demand response markets. So. Uh, let me ask my audience, so, so when, you, you know, when you go talk about this to the regulators and say, okay, here's people like Amory kind of arguing, this is where we need to go, what you get back, what I, certainly what I got in Germany and to, some, to a large extent in the United States, is a lot of fear. Uh, fear of, of going there. Fear of getting it wrong. People know, people like public service commissions know the potential political price of screwing up the electricity markets, and we've seen it happen in the United States uh, within the last 20 years a couple times. So uh, why is that fear still there, and, and, and how do we overcome it, and how do we begin to unlock innovation on both sides of the electric meter and get the rules right? I want to invite any panelists to jump in and respond to that. To break the uh, to break the ice, thank you. To to break the ice, um, it's perfectly understandable that people are afraid of change. Uh, it's perfectly understandable that with complexity, it's difficult to predict what will happen in the future. Um, and um, you don't change a winning team, and something has to be good ten times better. Has to be ten times better before it actually can displace the. Um, dominant technological configuration of the day. It's a case that is difficult to make. Um, we in Germany, I'm a German engineer. Um, I've been trained in constructive thinking. And for Germans, there are no challenges. No, there are no problems. There are only challenges. Um, you attack them bit by bit, and you learn as you go along. Um, the idea is not to design a future perfect system theoretically and then think of a way of, of um, putting it in place. The idea is to do things that are most likely to work and to try them out at small scale, learn from the failures, learn from the successes, roll out and repeat what, what has worked, and avoid a repetition of things that went wrong. It's this learning by doing rather than designing the whole thing. Um, and sometimes it is just in the minds of people. And just to play a ball back to you, Justin, you said my dishwasher goes on at four at night. Um, 
no, please don't, not in an apartment building, the neighbors won't like it. And in any case, your example reveals that you're still thinking that time of day pricing is the answer. In Germany, we know that there are two factors that determine um, um, prices. One is the seasonal variation and daily variation of the sun peak, and it co coincides very nicely with uh, uh, air conditioning. So if New York has an air conditioning peak, is a summer peaker and it has the air conditioning peak every summer day, then the simple solution is to say nobody can operate an air conditioning plant without having solar panels because the two things will cancel one another out when it comes to the grid impact. We know now that uh, the wind systems that are going over Germany are the most determining factor in the electricity prices over days. That is what the aluminum recyclers look at. They look at the forecast of the wind because it explains how much wind power will come into the system and how the price will go down over the next few days. The interesting thing we find is, um, uh, Chris King said, sometimes we have too much electricity, renewable electricity we need to curtail. That is sometimes true, but on many more days, we have, or hours actually, we have negative <coughs> prices of electricity in Germany. Now imagine that, somebody is selling electricity at a loss into the market rather than earthing it free of charge. You have to think deeply before you understand what drives an operator of a nuclear power plant or of a coal-fired or lignite-fired power plant to sell electricity as a, at a loss when they alternatively could earth it at no cost because they have the installations anyway. Think about it and suddenly you realize that there are guys in the incumbent utilities who want to drive up the cost of the policy in economic terms but also in political terms. They benefit from the disruption of having negative prices because it makes people uneasy. It, it adds to the complexity of the issue and the fear we have of moving into an area that is inexplicable. It's also hard to turn off a nuclear power plant, isn't it? So I, I might, I might continue. I fully understand that you, can't, that you can't regulate it down quickly enough, but you can earth the power that you can, cannot sell except at a loss. Before right. you pay somebody to take your electricity, you earth it. Uh, do we have people in the audience yet who are eager to ask questions or? Um... Justin, uh, yeah. I have a thought on your, your question. Sure. Um, and this, uh, thought about this a lot. So, so this is kind of a seemingly simple uh, recommendation for regulators, but it's, it's giving customers choices. So um, when looking at rates, for example, and this comes back to the time of use thing, the, the time of the peak is changing, the shape of the peak is changing. So how do you give customers choices? And there tends to be kind of a one rate fits all kind of approach. And that takes a very long time to figure out. By the time it's approved after two or three years of litigation, it's generally sort of out of date anyway. But if you have a menu of options, let customers choose them. And actually part of that, this may, um, I'll put this out there. Um, one of the things in the, uh, in the track one decision talked about uh, New York's policy that says, if you're a low income customer and you choose an alternate supplier their bill cannot be any higher than the regulated utilities bill. So that's kind of an inherent conflict. Are you giving that customer a choice or are you not giving them a choice? Um, so um, just think about giving choices, letting people make those choices, and then if they don't like them, making other choices. I don't want to leave the impression that none of this is starting to happen yet. I mean, it is happening at the edge. Uh, uh, a big, uh, the, the largest power, wholesale power exchange in the world, I believe, the PJM Interconnection, has been running uh, uh, demand response auctions for several years now. Uh, and so we've got people already who are sort of, you know, big industrial customers, for example, who are willing to raise their hands and say, you know, for a certain price, I'll turn my power plant off when, when you've got a, uh, a supply problem. And so, uh, in fact, we have a huge court battle going on about that that may, may go all the way to the Supreme Court right now. It's a little unclear uh, if what they're doing is, is going to uh, survive uh, legal scrutiny. Uh, Eleanor, let me ask you this question. How many other states are rushing in right behind New York to really grab this problem by the horns and try to deal with it? Or do you look out at, at the landscape and sort of see a lot of fear? You know, one of my favorite cartoons from The New Yorker was one that showed a long gallery filled with uh, gold picture frames, all of which were empty, 
and the caption was the regulators hall of fame right? <laughs> so um, you know predicting making predictions you know, our whole business is based on predictions and forecasts I think maybe it was the forecasters hall of fame anyway you get the idea so uh, there's a lot of fear of failure of course um, and I think a lot of states are looking at what New York is doing as we are also looking at what they're doing um, and and a lot of other countries are looking at what New York is doing. We have, you know, had certainly a lot of conversations with Germany, with the UK, with the Netherlands, uh, many other countries and many other states. Um, I think that we are looking at, um, we look at the, 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 the policies that have been introduced so far. We consider the first steps of REV, the first year or two, are kind of no regrets policies. We know we need far more renewables than we have in the system. We know we need to integrate uh, information technology into the system. Uh, the utilities are, are, are completely aware of the, the problems of uh, a contracting customer base and contracting uh, opportunities in their traditional lines of business and are certainly actively looking to enter new lines of business. So we see really... Uh, you know, of course, anything can fail, but I think that these are policies that are uh, reflect the fact that business as usual is not an attractive option to the utility industry or to the regulators or to government. There are too many, too many big bills coming due that'll fall on the on the backs of customers, and we need to be proactive in doing something about that. And the other thing, I'll just say two other quick things. One is that New York is trying to adopt, and I think this speaks to Chris's point, the um, kind of the business practice of rapid cycle prototyping, so try something, try it in a limited like, demonstration project uh, setting, uh, analyze the outcomes, move on if it fails, uh, massify it if it succeeds. And the other thing I just can't resist saying is that uh, we are actually working very closely with uh, Amory Levin's Rocky Mountain Institute, who are working as strategic par partners of the commission and have been traveling to New York every two weeks for the last year from Boulder. They travel to Albany. God help them every two weeks to work with us, and uh, we have really tapped their expertise and their background. Michael, let me ask you a question. So, uh, some of the American utilities are seeing this situation. They look at what's happened to market caps in Germany uh, and Denmark. Uh, they are terrified, uh, and the political response in some states has been to try to stop this, essentially, the sort of telephone company response, essentially. Let's fight this as hard as we can. So we have states where uh, the utilities are asking for sort of $50 and $100 surcharges on uh, customers that install uh, solar panels. Uh, we have states where, where uh, the utilities are trying to repeal uh, net metering. Uh, how do you see the sort of politics playing out? I, I, I don't. I think the environmentalists have sort of fought off a lot of that, but not all of it. Um, how do you see the politics of this uh, beginning to play out in the United States? And is a primary response of the utility industry going to be uh, to sort of stop the future from arriving? That's a good question, um, <laughs> and not one that I got beforehand. So. I'm having to think as I speak, but I think that what you just described happening in a few states, and we know sort of the, the, the um, lobbying groups that are helping coordinate that across states um, and, and sort of some of the tactics of that is, is really not all too surprising. In Germany, it, it's by no means so that utilities just watched and, and ignored and, and didn't push back. I mean, the whole um, past 10 years have been various attempts, as Andreas was also mentioning, to kind of stop or at least slow down the transition. Right now, all major utilities are vying very hard for a capacity market, which was essentially paid for, for incumbent for existing generating capacity. It's a subsidy for what already exists, which is essentially a way to keep going with the business model they have for a little bit longer, even though, and this is interesting, a leaked paper, internal paper by RWE, um, or was it Vattenfall? I think it was Vattenfall showed that they actually knew that a capacity market was not necessary. There was so much surplus capacity in the German market that really, for the next 10 years, we didn't need to actually subsidize incumbent capacity as a strategic reserve. So the tactics, you know, are, are similar in a, in a way. And I think what it tells me is that it's all just going to perhaps slow down a transformation that's inevitably happening anyway. And this brings me back a little bit to your earlier question where I was thinking sort of of, of the two sides you were showing. 
I mean, I go to, to, to work every day in Kendall Square and I'm surrounded by innovation and it's, it's just awesome. You can't help becoming enthusiastic. Just a few days ago, I was talking with Harvey Michaels, who, who Chris also knows, who was telling me, no, no, in, in, in 10 years, you know, Internet of Things, information communication technologies integrated with, with the electricity system, your toaster will react when the sun is briefly shaded by clouds and the solar panels within, you know, your, your cell, your grid cell um, will have a, a, a quick dip or your heating system will react or your cooling system. The buildings themselves will become an active um, dynamic partner in, in, in power generation and use. So I think that's, the trends there are quite clear. I think the big challenge, the big transformation which Indeed, because it's so fundamental for the business model, you see various attempts to kind of slow down or avert, but it is simply irreversible is that we're going from an, a, a way of remunerating power, um, power, strategic reserve, ancillary services based very much on CapEx and operating expenditures to one in the future, and it's just a matter of time, where it's really just the capital expenditures and the marginal cost of generating electricity is virtually zero, what's happening in Germany already. How do you capture that? How do you attach value? How do you make sure you still have you know, the storage, the strategic reserve capacities, et cetera, the dispatchable power? And I think that's where New York's model, but also the discussion Germany is undergoing this year is looking for entirely new ways of ensuring that revenue goes to the useful services to society. So I think we're heading there, and we, we can maybe sp slow it down a little bit, but it can't, it can't be averted. Okay, I know some people want, there's a bunch of hands up. Uh, I think the gentleman in the middle row back there was the first to throw his hand up. So um, d d tell us briefly your name and who you're with, if you would, as you ask your question. And um, I I'm going to invite sort of short, sharp questions to my panelists. Only I had that crystal ball. <laughs> um, well, I think it's a work in progress, and it's a collaborative work in progress because, um, you know, we, we've convened this market design group, for example, which is, includes the utilities and uh, representatives from various parts of the distributed energy world, academics, um, other sectors that are involved in the case, and they are working night and day for a very short period of time on, on a very complex set of questions. How do we design rules? What kind of rules have to be designed by government, for example? Uh, and, what, and, and to what extent are we going to over-design? And we don't want to have too many 300-page manuals if we could possibly avoid it. So um, definitely a work in progress. And, and I, th I would really stress that it's a collaborative endeavor. And there's a tremendous amount of wisdom out there um, from people who've been doing, using these kinds of technologies in other states and other countries. Uh, people who are visionaries, on, you know, who really can see this internet of things and, and see a way to bring it to bear, but also from the utility understanding of the grid. We, we are, you know, it's all based on the existing grid. We want to open it and expand it, but we, it's a very reliable and critical piece of infrastructure. So um, I'd say it's, it's being designed, but it's being designed by quite a few people, and I think that's a, that's a real strength. Uh, right here. We both know what we want to say, so I think yeah. there you go. 
I think Chris King also wants to say something. <laughs> One is nobody is happy to let utilities die um, uh, because it, 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 it destroys value um, and it destroys employment or it disrupts employment. Um, in actual fact, the trans energy transition in Germany does not destroy employment, it creates new employment. But within that process, there may be some businesses that um, lose their um, right to exist and therefore have to shed labor. But the people who work in the utility sector, they are very well trained, very well educated, and usually they don't find it difficult to find a job in the same region, in the same industry, elsewhere. So the social disruption is not as great as people sometimes make it out to be, except in the coal mining sector, which is a spe spe special case. Um, uh, there are people on the... Um, left of the political spectrum in Germany, um, and there are people in the municipal administrations who remember how nuclear power was, no, the central government encouraged the emergence of large utilities in Germany so that they would be able to build nuclear power plants, and the price for making that transformation was to curtail the rights of municipalities in Germany to set up their own municipally owned utilities. There is still an unresolved societal conflict between central state enabling big utilities versus um, uh, local authorities having um, uh, local municipal utilities. And there are some people who remember that fight from the 1970s and they now get their revenge. So they, there's some people who are happy to see big utilities uh, die. There are literally hundreds of new utilities. We have about 600 um, most of them new rural cooperatives. They invest in uh, uh, electricity. Uh, we have about 800 municipal um, uh, utilities. Uh, the number is rising. We have a process of remunicipalization. As they need cash, our big utilities now um, occasionally sell off distribution grid assets to the municipalities where they sit. Be they simply sell the network back to the utility and that re-municipalizes um, the uh, energy. And we have about 200 virtual utilities. They're lawyers with desks that shuffle contracts but don't have any physical <laughs> assets. Um, they are important because they provide competition, liquidity in the market, uh, choices for consumers, and they create options and they create a competitive pressure on everybody. And when you look at that, um, it's, it's, there's so many new companies that come in because they're new business models, new services that are being provided. They employ more people so that in, on the whole the sector is growing, which is not surprising because if you produce electricity on your own territory, you do it with your own business, your own labor, um, and if you import the, the fuel for generating the electricity, most of that value added will be outside of your territory. So the whole energy vendor policy in Germany is actually benefiting German industry, German business, German tax take, German employment. So that is why overall the balance is so positive. Chris. Provokes there, Chris. Yeah, there's a, there's a uh, very interesting specific case that I would encourage you to watch. This is Aeon Eon, which is the largest German utility. They are actually splitting. So they're taking all their generation assets, in, in essence, and putting those into one business, and then putting this, which is very similar to what's uh, the New York uh, platform approach. They're taking the customer-oriented functions, the distribution functions, and renewable energy functions, and putting them, uh, that's the new Eon going forward. So they've just announced this a couple of months ago, and they're just starting to take the initial steps, but that's a, an interesting one to keep an eye on. On Wall Street, we call that the good bank, bad bank yeah, strategy. Right. So I, I don't know which is the bad bank, <laughs> actually. But no like, comment. <laughs> it is, yeah, no, I, that was also the example that sprung to mind. And it's interesting, just sort of, or indicative, that by far the majority of jobs are in, remain in Eon, <clears throat> and just uh, something like 30% or so are in the spun off conventional generation company. Uh, I, will, I will point out, you know, when I went to Germany, the thing that the big utilities wanted to show me was offshore wind. Uh, and so I led the piece. Uh, for those of you who want to read that piece, if you just Google my name, uh, Justin Gillis, and Heligoland, you will, um, you will get the story because we started the story in Heligoland. Uh, and, you know, the reason they wanted to show me offshore wind was that it's big and capital intensive. Uh, and it's cost billion, gonna cost billions and billions of uh, dollars, euros, to put these uh, e immense turbines uh, in the middle of the North Sea. Uh, and so that's a role that the utilities see for themselves. I mean, you know, raising, cap raising huge amounts of capital and building big capital assets 
is historically what they have done. And so, now we could have that same thing happen here in the United States in theory, particularly if the prices for offshore wind go down. I mean, there are estimates that uh, we, could, we could supply half the East Coast with, uh, with offshore wind, and we've already got an active uh, leasing program going on for offshore sites. And I believe, you know, Cape Wind, it sounds like may be dead, but I believe we will have uh, the first offshore wind facility going in starting this spring um, off of Block Island. So, uh, there, there, and you can make the same argument, I think, maybe about, uh, uh, about uh, large-scale distribution lines. Uh, you know, there may be some sort of capital-intensive stuff here that only uh, big utilities can do, which is a reason not to sort of drive them into ruin. Uh, uh, right here. <laughs> I think uh, I'll just take a crack at that. Um, it's interesting. When I was on that trip that I was describing to eight cities, uh, one of the one of the issues that people raised at all of every one of these meetings was the need for energy democracy. And I'd never heard of energy democracy, so I went home and did some research, and I found out that this concept actually originated in Germany and came here via some activists and political people. In, uh, maybe five years ago. So um, it definitely is a new, it's a new concept, and um, it was it's a very exciting concept. I think uh, in terms of empower the possibilities of empowering local communities to take control over their energy production and usage, and uh, it has it's beginning to spawn some proposals in all of the utility service territories all around the state um, by communi different communities to either propose some aggregated solar or whole other new uh, models. So I think it's going to take hold and communities are also talking to each other who did, didn't know about each other. Uh, they thought it was just they were doing isolated projects. So it's already spreading. Uh, t the clock is ticking here, but I think we're going to uh, plan to go about five minutes over uh, so we can squeeze in a few more questions. Uh, I, I, I've, I've been st stuck on this side of the room, so I'm going to jump over here. Uh, let's see. Uh, we'll start right here. Um, this is for uh, Ms. Stein. I, I heard, you know, with the rev of, of could you, I'm sorry, could you tell us your name briefly? Uh, my name's Marjorie Schaub. Um, I'm speaking personally, but I, I'm here for the Manage Good Citizens for Sustainability. Um, the, reason, the question I'm asking is because I heard that, for example, in Suffolk County, that they want to build small uh, natural gas. I'm not familiar with the specific project you're talking about, but I will say that uh, there is reference in the REV order in February to uh, the, uh, the hope that the uh, pending regulations by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation to extend the regulation, environmental regulation of energy generating plants down to a much smaller levels will be uh, going forward in the near future, and we're hoping that that will happen. And that will take care of some of those problems. There is a 328-page order, I think, that the uh, PSC issued in February. I would actually, I can't claim to have read every single word of it, but I would commend it to people. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a much more sweeping uh, and visionary document than you uh, would normally expect a 300-page order of the Public Service Commission to be. So uh, particularly the opening sections of it are uh, worth 
uh, people's time. Uh, wasn't there somebody sort of in the middle? Let's let's go up here to the front row. I have a question on wind generation. Your, your name, please. Could, could you bring that to a question? Um, yeah. Uh, it seems to me, uh, 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 with the experience in Europe of these offshore wind generation turbines, uh, a total waste of, of, of a huge white elephant that the utilities will regret in some few years. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious if people on the panel have you know, uh, what they think of my... Uh, Andreas, talk to us about the economic of offshore wind and cost curves and all that, if you would, yeah. Bad. Um, uh, one thing is the projects are very large, so we need to invest billions. Second is they're very difficult to implement because the ships can only operate for a few weeks a year in the territory, and the North Sea is clement compared to the seas around uh, the um, uh, state of New York. Third, um, the um, environment out there is incredibly corrosive. They use the best materials that they have. Stainless steel apparently begins to rust within months for reasons that they cannot explain properly. There seems to be something about electrics in the marine air, um, salty environment. That means um, the stuff is not going to last as long as they thought it would be. Um, and maintenance intervals are going to be shorter and the cost of maintaining them will be higher. And you're right, Justin, um, the development of offshore uh, industry was pushed by the big utilities because the size of the projects, the risk management associated with that, uh, the financial engineering that had to go into it, um, all made it that an area where only the big utilities could operate. The small community-owned utilities simply couldn't go offshore. Um, and they de-risked those investments um, in two ways. One is to have a feed-in tariff that is generous enough to recover the, the, the cost. And the second one is if there is a delay in the building of the, of the uh, turbines or the connection of the wind park to the grid, uh, they get their money as if they were generating electricity and bringing it to market, and the customer has to pay for it even though he doesn't get anything. And then the utilities also make money by selling electricity from fossil-operated uh, plants to replace the electricity that is not coming onshore from the wind turbines. It's absolutely amazing how they've rigged the German system. Um, luckily, the German politicians have uh, wisened up to it and have put a stop to it. So all the projects are already licensed. They will be continued, and they will be built. And after that, Germany will stop that nonsense. Uh, I don't want to argue with you or him, but I will say, uh, I think the theory is uh, to capture uh, economies of scale and declining cost curves in the same way we've done with, with uh, wind. I, I mean, I'm not, you know, that may be wrong, but, but the, that is the argument you hear from the, from the big utilities. Um, I think we've got uh, room, time for maybe one more question. I'm going to ask Max Grunig to start sneaking up to the podiums because he's going to give our uh, final remarks. Uh, let's go with the lady right over here. Which projects do you mean specifically? Uh, Who wants to tackle that? Okay. I'll combine it with the leading question that Suzanne Hunt asked earlier, um, because it was actually 
um, normal people, um, farmers, dentists in rural areas, they clubbed together, they invested in the first wind turbines. Anybody who, who wanted to build one had to find a farmer who was willing to give the land, the use of the land, and had to pass the hat round uh, in the local community in order to raise the capital. That was in the beginning of the industry when it was relatively cheap, when you build small wind turbines um, um, and you build them one by one. Um, at that point in time, it was possible to build community ownership because everybody actually had a possibility of putting money in, $10,000 perhaps at a time. So it was a very low um, uh, entry level uh, to that. And essentially the community, and once people in a village have an opportunity to buy a stake in the wind turbine, or they had the opportunity and they declined, then that buys off their opposition to it because they know that their, their neighbors, their friends, um, their family members, they're earning money from it. It, it changes the, the equation and that creates both a democracy and a community engagement and a buy-in and it creates acceptance. Um, if, however, you go in now and you pour um, a big plant um, wind um, park into a plain state in the United States, outside investors coming in, large um, project development company coming in, absolutely no interest in engaging with the local community because they don't want to have retail investors in the mix. It just makes it too complicated to make it all bankable. My advice um, from the distance from Germany, not knowing the details, is that in order to main build and maintain community support for these projects, is to enable the local communities to benefit from it, not only in terms of employment and tax um, revenue that they earn, but also by allowing them to buy a stake. Um, and perhaps community foundations could step in as aggregators. They could sign up to a certain percentage of the investment in a wind park and then peddle that retail to people who live within sort of cert certain postal districts or whatever else you want to use uh, as that. Um, under which circumstances could a community foundation do that sort of engagement? It is risky. How can you de-risk it? What's the role of regulation and what's the role of government funds, um, uh, green uh, funds or whatever, in order to help community foundations to do that? Because the technology has moved to the point that you cannot replicate what Germany did in the 1980s, where people passed the hat round to build cheap, singular wind turbines. It is the nature of the business that this is multi-billion dollar investment each time. So you need different mechanisms for making that happen, and this is just one idea I hope is useful for some people. We could, of course, have a whole panel on distributed versus centralized generation, and probably we should, but today we are out of time. Uh, thank you all for your attention. I'm going to ask Max to give some closing remarks. Well, thank you very much, uh, Justin. Um, yeah, my name is Max Grunig with the Ecologic Institute, and I want to keep it very short because we're already over the time, and I don't have... Um, all right, I don't want to open a new discussion, as Justin just said. We could probably start discussions on all these various topics. I mean, I don't know. First of all, I want to say is I think really the discerning factor is that what you introduced, that you look at it as a system, the, considering the energy sector as a system from each and every consumer to the utilities. The solistic view on it is, I think, very different from what we've seen in many other states or countries uh, when tackling it. And that doesn't, of course, guarantee a perfect outcome. And that's also something that Andrea said earlier. It's not about having the perfect plan from first letter to the last page. It's about designing um, a breathing plan, a, a plan that's able to adapt to reality. And I think that's really important to see that we're not talking about having um, a master plan, a communist style five year plan. It's about having the framework set up. The framework for consumers, prosumers, very important. Also linking to the rooftop solar, but also this citizen owned wind parks, citizen owned solar parks. And then of course the utilities as well. I think. We've seen also a little bit the, the dilemma or the balance that has to be uh, navigated between keeping it simple, as Chris King said, it, keep it simple, that's the key to success in Germany, but of course having a holistic system perspective is not really keeping it very, very simple. And I think that's really the, the challenge here and it's, it's an opportunity and a challenge to have both perspectives in mind, to keep it simple, but having the big picture in mind. 
And of course, keeping it simple, you can look at it and on various levels, going from the consumer perspective, the ratepayer perspective, but of course also the entire regulatory framework, which is supposed to then also spur innovation and new business models in, at the utilities perspective. So I would like to thank you all for bringing in these various perspectives from uh, the regulatory perspective, from the private sector perspective, from German perspective and American perspective. And above all, I would like to thank Danielle for co-hosting this year with the NYU Warini Center today, and of course, Georg Mauer uh, from the German Embassy for making this international exchange of ideas possible. And uh, thank you again, Justin, for moderating so brilliantly. Thank you. Thank you.